questions in the court? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, so welcome to the 10th meme seminar now. We have Kalis Afnan, uh, who did meme from 2014 to 2016 with me. Uh, he is originally from Malaysia and he is now back in Malaysia, uh, working for WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society, on um, really like on the ground uh, conservation efforts specifically for Malaysian elephants. So go ahead. All right. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone, for having me. I'm going to start my, count, uh, my timer so that I know where I am. Um, so the way um, I'm going to conduct this talk is I'm going to show you some of the pictures of animals that we have uh, captured using our camera traps. And I would like for you guys to like write it down or like guess what the animals are. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll like reveal the answers. And hopefully uh, you can, you know, you know uh, all of animals, but if you don't, it's fine. Uh, because I also did, did not know most of the animals before I started joining. So the title of the uh, uh, seminar is uh, Race Against Time, Saving Malayan Tiger and Asian Elephants of Malaysia. And uh, a bit, a little bit about myself, uh, originally from Malaysia, and I did my undergraduate in University of California at Davis. After that, I worked for several, several years at the university and then continued my master's with Erasmus Mundus. Uh, I went to Uppsala University and uh, Ludwig Maximilian University. So I spent a year in both. And upon coming back, I joined Wildlife Conservation Society at first as a researcher with the Tiger Project. And now I'm the assistant coordinator of the Elephant Project. And this picture was taken uh, last year after um, we swam through a, a plantation ditch, which was filled with muddy water and aquatic plants. Like you could feel the carpet of aquatic plants underneath and the smell was horrible and it took so long for us to like wash away the dirt from our clothes so it's um that's kind of like the reality of field work and so the aim of this talk uh, hopefully you have guessed what this anim animal uh is hopefully okay so the aim of the talk uh today is to share conservation actions conducted to protect the landscape and wildlife, specifically the Malayan tigers and Asian elephants of Malaysia. Uh, uh, right now I'm showing you a different animal if you want to guess what that animal is. Pheasant. Uh, you can just write it down. You don't have to like say it. But, but we can, um, at the end, uh, when I, uh, I'll show you the picture again and we can all guess. But peasant is a good um, guess. What kind? Okay, so the outline, I will talk about Malaysia, uh, the Malaysian natural biodiversity and threats to the biodiversity. And then I will talk about Wildlife Conservation Society, Malaysia program, and the natural stronghold, uh, which is in our own pin landscape. And then the lastly, the conservation actions that we do. And conservation, the conservation actions will be the biggest, longest part of this talk. And the next uh, picture is this one. If you want to guess the animal. All right. So Malaysia is uh, situated in Asia, so uh, in that red blob on a global map, and uh, specifically in the Southeast Asia. So th the north is Thailand, south of us is Singapore, this one, and also Indonesia. So most people would know those three countries, but actually Malaysia is smack right in the middle of that orgy. So Specifically, Malaysia is divided into two parts, uh, the West Malaysia or Peninsula Malaysia, where I work, and there's uh, East Malaysia, uh, comprised of Sabah and Sarawak on the island of Borneo. So now you know the island of Borneo is not a country. It is uh, it's consisted of three countries, which is Indonesia, Brunei, and Malaysia. So please do not get confused. And 
Malaysia, uh, this is an advertisement um, by our tourism, uh, Malaysian tourism. Um, and I think it kind of like, uh, surf, uh, it reflects what Malaysia is. So on the left, it's uh, full of culture, um, uh, diversity of uh, language, and in the middle is the biodiversity. On, on the right is diversity of food. We are very proud of our cooking. I think some of you might have uh, tasted my uh, cooking. I think Etienne, maybe Frida. I don't know about Charles. Yeah, uh, yeah, but people who've tried my cooking, I think they would say it's good. If you don't, I'm not, we're not friends. Okay, so next uh, slide, I'll be talking about Malaysian biodiversity. If you wanna uh, guess the, that animal and that is not a ghost. I know the hand looks like ghost ish but it's not are people actually guessing on the in the chat <laughs> okay so malaysia is 12th most my uh, mega diverse country in the world uh, um, and other countries in the list include usa china india uh, indonesia philippines and malaysia among all of those countries is quite small relatively and yet we have uh, you know a mega diverse uh, biodiverse uh, plants and uh, animals and insects uh, it's because of our location in the north of the equator so you can read all of the you know numbers of species that we have and i i feel like there's probably way more that we still haven't um uh identified so yeah uh, which is why it's quite uh, important to protect these uh, species from threats, which is my next slide. If you want to guess this animal first. This one might be quite difficult. Personally, I didn't even know it exists before I started working. Okay, so threats to biodiversity in Malaysia, uh, if not globally, it's uh, poaching and over exploitation of uh, plants and animals, um, such as uh, overfishing, the human wildlife conflicts that would lead to um, killing the animals uh, because of retaliation, invasive species that replace native species, di diseases that kills uh, native uh, species, climate change, uh, for example, floods or drought that kills off uh, populations. And lastly, habitat loss and degradation. So on the right side, you can see a plot. Uh, it shows the forest area in Peninsula Malaysia. So only on the West Malaysia. And it shows that there's a decline um, since 1950. So in 1950, there was 9.7 million hectare of forest area. And in 2019, last year, uh, two years ago, it's of 5.73 million hectares. That's a decrease by 4 million. We can see that in the 1990s, the decline has kind of slowed down. But in the end, the general trajectory is decreasing. And even when we talk to the forestry department, if there's any chance for us to increase the, uh, uh, the number uh, of forest area, and they say it's probably very difficult. And this one shows the fragment, uh, this is a map showing the fragmentation of natural forest cover uh, from 1954 to 2000. And we can observe that the forest area has been becoming more and more fragmented. So in 2017, the forest cover in Peninsula Malaysia is 44%. Most of the forest cover is made up by permanent reserve forest area. And out of this permanent reserve forest area, only 31% are for biodiversity, meaning it cannot be logged. It has to be protected at all costs. And the remaining is for production forests, which is slated for logging and also forest plantation. So the other 70% of this 44% or almost 44% can be logged and uh, developed into forest plantations. So a lot of people would say that having almost half of the country as forested areas is not too bad, right? Like 44% is not bad, right? But not if the country has megafauna. So one of the megafaunas in Malaysia is tiger and also Asian elephant. 
on average a male tiger the home range for it um to find food and uh, for its habitat is 300 kilometers square and that is half the size of new uh, new york and the uh, male elephant the home range can go up to 400 kilometers square the home range for a female tiger or tigress is 100 kilometers square and at least three home ranges of a tigress overlap with the home range of a male tiger so in a 300 kilometer square you can expect to find uh, about four tigers so if you think about half of uh, the size of new york city there are four tigers in there and the reported total amount of adult tiger per 100 kilometers square is between 0 0.07 to 1.28 and i think this might also be a global um uh, it might be taken globally this uh this result so megafauna like tiger, elephant, tape, uh, bearded pig, which is an Edam species, needs extensive areas and large amount of food in order for them to survive, which is why it is very important uh, to save the landscape and also the animals in there in order for them to survive. And that is where we come in. And before I start talking about our organization, I'm going to let you guys guess what those animals are. I hope you know what those are. If not, I think there's probably something wrong with you guys. This should be the easiest one. Okay. Wildlife Conservation Societies and International NGO with a clear goal to conserve the world's largest wild places in 14 priority regions, home to more than 50% of the planet's biodiversity. Our mission is to save wildlife and wild places worldwide through science, conservation action, education, and inspiring people to value nature. WSS Malaysia is part of the Southeast Asian Archipelago region. So if uh, this is a map showing our 14 priority regions. So Malaysia is part of the Southeast Asian Archipelago, um, including uh, Indonesia, uh, Singapore, and Philippines will have uh, one soon. And you can see that our offices or programs are kind of everywhere in the world. So yeah, this is a global NGO. Our, in Malaysia, our project sites are divided into the Peninsula Malaysia and also Sarawak on the island of Borneo. In Peninsula Malaysia, our landscape is on uh, the south, uh, southern part of uh, Peninsula Malaysia. And our project mainly focus on Malayan tiger and Asian elephant. Whereas in Sarawak, they have a bit more uh, areas or landscapes that they can focus on. And they uh, focus on sharks and rays and Borneoan orangutan. And now I'll be talking about Endar Rompin landscape, which is one of nat the natural strongholds in Peninsula Malaysia, after you guess this animal. Okay, our landscape uh, consists of forest complexes from Lesung until Panti Permanent Forest Reserve. You do not need to know the name. This is a slide that I use for the government, um, meeting with government. Uh, suffice to know that uh, there are permanent reserve uh, forests and the areas where there are diagonal lines are protected areas meaning those are the state and uh, uh, national parks so those areas cannot be logged uh, but these other areas uh, while they may be permanent reserve forest areas they can be logged for uh, resources and etc we main our landscape is mainly the, the connected uh, forest areas so there are forest areas next to it but it's fra fragmented, so we don't include it in our kind of core area. Uh, and this entire uh, landscape, we call it in our Rompin landscape. But our landscape also faces uh, threats by habitat loss and also degradation. So in this map, the green area is forested area or our landscape. And the ones colored in red are areas where they have been locked um since 2013 to 2018 so we are facing um reduction in habitat or habitat loss 
And whenever you go to these areas where logging are rampant, you can see um, an area called Matau. So it's uh, everything is kind of clean. Um, all the trees are removed, and those are that is an area where the logs are piled up, and it will be the, the log to be packed and then transferred to the factory. And it's it's a huge area that when it's like the size of a stadium. And it's really saddening when you go, you know, you what you want is to protect the landscape and you go and see this and it's very, it's very sad. And we also face threats by the Indo-Chinese poachers and also local poachers. Uh, however, the Indo-Chinese poachers are a professional illegal poaching syndicate. For example, in July 2018, the government uh, had a seizure worth of 500,000 ringgit, which is around 100,000 euros. And one of the seizures is uh, the tiger skin, meaning one of the tigers in the landscape has been killed uh, in order to get the skin. And these poachers also illegally harvest agarwood, uh, which is one of the biggest, um, sorry, one of the expensive uh, materials to make incense. And while they harvest agarwood or poach, they also hunt and snare wildlife for food for their own consumption. So this is an example of a snare. And snares, when people set it up, it does not uh, choose the victim. So any animals that step into a snare will be caught. And so those animals might uh, either be injured. And these are some of the pictures that we get from our own um, landscape showing all uh, effects of snares. So these animals are injured. The bear, well, I, I'm not gonna say the name. Um, so this, the, the, the is, it has lost its foot. And this one, uh, the foot has been um, injured. So when this happens to carnivore, they will find uh, easier prey. So that means they probably will eat cows and lambs instead of hunting for the actual, actual prey. And that uh, would uh, cause conflicts between human and tigers. Oh. And human wildlife conflicts also lead to retaliatory killing. For example, in 2019, two years ago, four elephants in our landscape died due to poisoning. So farmers who have planted crops in the village um, the crops are open for uh, being attacked by elephants. Elephants will come up from the forest and eat the crops. And so the farmers would harbor negative feelings towards these elephants. And if the problems has become too severe, uh, the farmers might take drastic measures. And that includes poisoning these elephants. And when I came to observe this uh, situation from far away, you know, I thought I was like seeing a huge rock boulder and no, there are like three dead elephants. Um, one of them, one of the elephants was pregnant. And the other case, um, the other dead elephant was, uh, was killed a few months later in different area. So that kind of shows that, you know, people are getting angry about um, the conflicts with elephants and uh, government and NGO has to like, uh, take action to mitigate this, uh, manage these situations. And this is where we come with our conservation actions. Um, if you can guess what that animal is. All right. Our conservation actions have to be multi-pronged. Like we have to attack uh, this uh, problem from multiple directions. So we collaborate strongly with government and non-governmental agencies to increase the protection of the landscape and wildlife. We study the wildlife demography. We try to mitigate human wildlife conflicts and uh, encourage coexistence. We also monitor the habitat for um, land use change or logging in the area. And we also support enforcement activities to reduce poaching pressure in the landscape. And to address wildlife population, this is probably the biggest 
kind of the scientific part of our conservation actions. So we perform scientific research on the targeted species, demography, and population size. So once we know the numbers of uh, animals in the landscape, we can uh, relay that information to the government so that they make decisions uh, for the wildlife management in the area. And one of the ways is to service uh, camera traps uh, in the forest. And that is used to estimate the tiger population size. And most of the times to reach those sites, we have to track and camp for multiple days in the forest. And we have to carry heavy backpacks, not just you know, food and uh, necessities. We also have to carry equipment like cameras, batteries, um, cables, and yeah. So that the equipment part makes the backpack like heavy. Um, food and clothes are usually not that bad. So beginning 2009, WCS has conducted full-scale camera trapping surveys every two years to monitor the trend in Malayan tiger population density. So in 2017, the total camera trapping site was 120 sites. So the stars that you see in the map is the camera trapping site. And each site might have one or two cameras. And the active camera period per site is around three months. So what we do is we, um, beginning May, we go into the forest and I set up cameras. And then after three months, we go back to the same location, retrieve the camera and then place it in a different area. Um, and then we leave that for another three months. So then the camera trapping period uh, begins from May until this December. And each of the tigers that we have captured uh, in the camera, uh, they have different stripes and patterns. These are unique to the individual, much like our thumbprints. Therefore, from the images, we can uh, determine between different tigers. And you can see here how these two tigers have different patterns um, and stripes. And using that information, we can say that, OK, uh, on the fifth day of um, uh, on the fifth day of this whatever time period, we detect um, individual A in this location. So you can have a matrix of detection and non-detection according to the individual tiger throughout the entire active camera trapping period. And then if you couple that uh, with the GPS coordinate, you can estimate the population abundance and density. And that model we call um, spatially explicit capture recapture model. Uh, if you have more questions about this, I can ans answer later uh, because it, you know, it's quite uh, complicated to explain right now. Uh, camera trapping also give a bycatch. Um, so it, uh, other than tigers, it also shows other animals that exist or uh, occupy or present in the area. So for example, an area would have a tape or a herd of elephants. And it also shows the status and condition of animals in the area. So for example, we can uh, we observe that an elephant, the, the trunk was uh, caught in a snare or a sun bear, was, the right pawpaw was also snared. And yeah, unfortunately I cannot share the, the tiger data or results with you guys uh, because it's quite sensitive. And, but the national tiger survey that have been conducted in 2007, yeah, 2017, uh, we have estimated less than 200 tigers in Peninsula Malaysia. The Bornean site or Sabah and Sarawak does not have tiger. So tiger only exists in the peninsula and the number is less than 200. And for elephant population estimation in 2008, we have conducted a dung count based survey to estimate the population size. So what happens is that we have to walk along a transect line in the forest and then find the number of dung piles along the transect lines. So the total length of transect lines uh, was 194.56 kilometers. We did a survey from April to August 2008. I said we, but actually I did not do this one. And so we need a couple more information in order to estimate the uh, population size. So one of it is dung decay rate. So we need to know how long does it take for a fresh uh, elephant dung uh, on average to completely decay. So actually this experiment was, uh, it began even a year earlier. So they uh, marked all the fresh elephant dung 
and then they come uh, they came back every three to six uh, nine uh, a year to see uh, if the fresh elephant dung has completely decayed and they have uh, data on 442 dung piles so based on that is uh, it takes a, on average 308.67 days for it uh, for a dung to completely decay and they also did a defecation rate uh, of an individual elephant so an individual elephant would defecate around 18 times uh, a day so if you have your total dung piles that you have uh, observe along the transact lines, you divide it by the dung decay rate times the application rate, then you can estimate the Asian elephant population size. That's kind of the most basic model for that. And so the population estimate in 2007, 2008, uh, in Taman Negara or Taman and Taman Negeri in Darongpin, which is uh, our landscape, we estimated around 135 elephants. That's the point estimation. And at the same time, we also did it in Taman Negara, um, which is the, the biggest, kind of most um, well-known um, national parks in the peninsula. And that one, the, type, the number of elephants was uh, estimated to be 631 elephants. But the number might be higher uh, also because uh, most of the translocated elephants from other areas will be put in that area. So maybe that's why uh, there's so, so many of them. To address human wildlife conflicts, we mitigate uh, human wildlife conflicts by guiding or helping villagers and providing mitigation tools and also teaching basic conservation awareness education to local indigenous school age children. So what we usually do is we go to the uh, villagers and we would ask if they have problems with elephants or other wildlife. So some sort of interview to understand the situation in the village and for villages that we know um, have uh, experiencing high human wildlife conflicts, we would uh, try to educate the school children so that you know they don't uh, they don't grow up thinking that wildlife is not good uh, for them. So we would uh, show them you know uh, there are benefits or the functions of wildlife or biodiversity, etc. In in uh, uh, for each wildlife or plant and have them kind of make their own decision as they grow up as to whether, uh, whether or not these animals are important or not to them. We, one of the ways that we, uh, or methods that we teach to manage human elephant conflict is siren fencing. It's, it is one of the early warning system used to alert farmers of elephant encroachment. So what uh, we do is we set up a wire fence uh, at the orchard forest boundary and this wire is connected to a uh, not to a uh, is connected to siren kits so when elephants push the wire it will trigger the alarm and that will wake up the farmers uh, who sleep nearby uh, the orchards and they will wake up and chase away the elephants safely with proper technique usually it involves using light like he uh, headlamp or torchlights um, Usually using lights is already sufficient to chase away elephants. We also conduct social surveys to gauge the social economic, social economic impacts of human elephant conflicts to smallholders. For this one, we collaborate with a university, um, Nottingham University in Malaysia, uh, specifically the affiliated research body called Management and Ecology of Malaysian Elephants. We conduct a peninsula-wide study on HDC, human elephant conflicts, because we are interested in studying the impacts of HDC uh, to the smallholders and also their affinity towards conservation. Are they willing to pay for conservations and also insurance um, scheme? So those are things that we would like to know. And those kind of information we can again relay to the government body so that they make the decision um, hopefully good decisions another thing that we do is plantation survey we go into oil palm or um, agricultural areas and then we survey the boundary for uh, to determine the effectiveness of human elephant conflict mitigation system so what most of the plantations do is they would set up electric fence and also uh, elephant ditch 
along the boundary. So that is a barrier to uh, stop elephants from going into the plantation and eat the crops. Um, but it's not 100% uh, effective. Uh, elephants are very smart, so they find ways to kind of circumnavigate uh, the challenges. And we also look uh, for elephant signs so that we know if there are elephant presence inside the plantation and also surrounding areas. And if you look at the picture, on the left side, that is the forest area. So that is a forest, um, so that's a forest plantation boundary. Um, to the right is our palm plantation. So we walk along the boundary to find elephant signs, among other things. So this is a map uh, showing, so the green is the forest areas, orange is the protected areas, and the black line is the plantation that we have surveyed, and the red, point, the red points are elephant signs that we have uh, observed. And the general trend is that if the plantation is uh, located next to forest areas or main river, there we observe way more elephant signs than, for example, uh, plantation located or surrounded by other plantations. So that kind of tells us uh, the river is, a, or especially the riparian area, is very important for elephant uh, habitat. So maybe in the future, that's, uh, if you want to create corridors for elephant and other wildlife, we should focus on riparian areas. Uh, to address land use change, we monitor landscapes for land use and land cover change using uh, satellite images. And once we see uh, changes in the landscape, we go to the area and ground truth the area. For example, so the map on the left shows um, logging activities um, last uh, in, in the year 2000 from February to July. So that's five months. So yeah, so five months of uh, logging activity and that already that much of like uh, area already being cleared. So what we do is we generate points. So on the top right, you generate points within the areas that uh, have already been um, uh, convert logged. And then we send our teams to see what happens to the area because um, some areas are left um, by itself uh, and then the forest will regenerate. Some areas will be converted into forest plantation. So uh, on the bottom, uh, the one, the point, the X point shows where the forest plantations are. So our team has found forest plantation, latex plantation, also oil palm plantation. However, oil palm plantation can't be uh, uh, planted within forest area because it's not considered forest. So that one was uh, kind of cordoned off by the forestry department. So I think the company might be sued or something or their activities kind of like, you know, they have to be stopped. We also monitor uh, the corridor. So we, the forest blocks within uh, Peninsula Malaysia are connected by corridors. Um, and it, this is part of the national physical plan called Central Forest Spine. So we go to the corridors and to see if elephants still use it, um, if there are even elephants uh, at the area. And we also enter, uh, uh, go into the forest itself to see if there are uh, forests in the, uh, if, if there are elephants in the forest. And this is actually one of the best kind of uh, field work that I've done. It's so amazing. We uh, we got to go to really nice, amazing places. Awesome experience. And so, if you look at the map, uh, the area with uh, within the red box. We could not find elephant signs in there. So our uh, we also interviewed the people who live nearby, if they uh, have seen or known um, elephant presence in the, in the area. And they said uh, ever since a uh, um, highway was built, so the black line is a highway. It's a main like three lane highway. Um, since the high highway was built, elephants were not in the area anymore. So we believe or our, our, our hypothesis is that the population of uh, elephants in the south 
has been completely uh, separated from the population in the north and that consequently disrupt the genetic diversity and areas where there were elephants before now the areas are um, experiencing loss of ecological functions because elephants are not there anymore so if there are trees that require elephants to spread the seeds away um, uh, from the mother tree then the tree can't uh, the function is already uh, gone because there's no elephants that can do that so that's bad and however there's recently a revival of the central forest pine project and with a emphasis to improve the corridor itself and also stopping current forested areas from being developed or logged and wcs is directly involved in the meetings and we present our field findings and we also advise um, the consultants uh, and also government agencies uh, to focus on several important areas for wildlife corridor. So this revival is very, is, is quite positive uh, for us. We hope we uh, can achieve more uh, in the future. To address wildlife crime, so a little bit about this picture, this, this actual uh, picture that, um, sorry, actual carcass of elephants that we found in an oil, plum, uh, oil palm plantation. So we were surveying the plantation and then we smell this horrible smell and then we're like, mm, something died. We did not expect to see elephant. Um, so yeah, we took, we took this picture. We also um, informed the wildlife department um, of it. So it is a male elephant. So the tusk has, has been removed. So we're not sure if the elephant uh, was poisoned or they, uh, it was actually killed to get the task. So we support enforcement work by conducting multi-agency joint patrol uh, to decrease uh, poaching and snaring pressure in the landscape. So we, uh, we ourselves do not have power to uh, apprehend uh, poachers or whoever, uh, but the government agencies, they have power to do so. So what we do is we plan um, multi-agency joint patrol uh, involving all these uh, agencies um, so that they can apprehend the poachers um, and we just help. And the state sultan is the patron of the multi-agency state-led conservation projects and for the government agency side it includes the forestry department, the wildlife and national parks department, uh, royal Malaysian police, um, for the Johor state, uh, it involves the National Parks Corporation, which is the state uh, national park. And for non-government agencies, include us and also Kulim Plantation. We support in the planning and uh, paying for meals, transportation, and also equipment. Uh, since, and this, remember I told you about the uh, National Tiger Survey. So because there's less than, there are less than 200 tigers in the peninsula of Malaysia, the government now uh, started uh, an initiative called Operasi uh, Bersepadu Hazana, which involves the Department of Wildlife and National Park and the Royal Malaysian Police since September 2019. So what they do is they actively patrol all forest areas. So in a month, they will be in there for three weeks, just patrolling areas uh, to catch poachers. And in 2000, both 2019 and 2020, 227 offenders were apprehended, more than 1,000 wire snares were removed, and uh, more than 4 million or Euro 900k were confiscated. So we support the efforts in many capacities because uh, we are the ones that usually go into the fields, you know, to set up cameras or whatever. So we understand the landscape really well. We know where to enter, we know where to get out, we know where these uh, you know, mountains are, etc. So our deep knowledge of the landscape um, and how to enter data into database, how to visualize those information into maps, uh, those, all those knowledge are critical to support these uh, government that initiatives. And in, uh, in 17 February 2021, the Operasi Bersepadu Hazana won the Asia Environmental Enforcement Award uh, by United Nations Environment Programme. So we are very proud of them. Um, we think this award is a very good um, 
uh, encouragement for the government to continue on uh, and hopefully it will go on forever. So what kind of messages would the wildlife want you to take home? Uh, landscape and wildlife conservation requires multi-pronged strategy and multi-agency collaborations. Scientific, non-scientific strategies um, are required to address and uh, protect landscape and wildlife. Due to the increasing overlap of natural and human-dominated landscape, human wildlife coexistence should be promoted. So it's not enough now to just protect natural world. We have to also promote coexistence between human and wildlife because some uh, wildlife species are entering human spaces. And when they do, it causes conflicts. And uh, most of the time, these animals are the ones getting the, uh, the, uh, the other end of the stick. For example, um, macaques um, or monkeys uh, have really high conflicts with humans. And what they do is they would capture these uh, monkeys and they would just kill them. So I feel that uh, wild, human wildlife coexistence now should also be a priority um, in, in, in any strategies. Wildlife crime is an organized crime and it is persistent due to continuous demands. And it is very annoying because some countries just blatantly sell uh, human, uh, sorry, um, wildlife uh, derived uh, wildlife derivatives or wildlife products. And it's just, yeah, it's very saddening and that that happens. If that uh, stops, a lot of the um, things that the, our wildlife is facing will be gone. There's still threats from other, um, other aspects, but at least they will not be posed uh, for um, for weird, you know, medicines or um, uh, jewelries. And lastly, one of the best things to do for the environment is to hold your local council or uh, a political uh, <laughs> local council uh, for politi uh, politicians uh, and businesses responsible for the adverse impacts on the local environment. This is what we call a grassroots movement. So if your local politicians know that they are being held responsible for whatever adverse in, uh, impacts on the local environment, they will do their best to like push for you know, a better uh, improved uh, act on let's say wildlife or forestry, or they would push for the businesses uh, to be better. So this is actually one of the best things that we do. Um, in addition to you know your recycling, reducing, and etc., um, because I think this impact will be more tangible um, to the country. And yeah, so I hope today um, my aim, uh, which was to share the conservation actions we, that we have conducted to protect the landscape and wildlife, specifically Malayan tigers and Asian elephants of Malaysia. Um, you know, uh, you've learned a lot or maybe something. And so I will go over the answers. Um, you can open up your mic and guess what this animal is. Unmute, sorry. <laughs> what is this animal? <coughs> Malaysian elephant. Good. Okay, Asian elephant. I have to put in the scientific name because you scientif scientists would like to know that one. Um, what is this one? <clears throat> the pheasant I said before. <laughs> huh? the Asian pheasant. Um, now there were jungle uh, pheasants. Um, pheasant is really close. It's great Argus pheasant. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, scientific name is Argus. Nian is Argus. What about this one? Tapir. Asian Malaysian. Tapir. Malaysian tapir. Oh, and, I was right. <laughs> and tapir. Uh, tapir is indicus. What about this one? Malaysian, gibbon. Malaysian gibbon. Uh, yeah, white, <laughs> white headed gibbon or halobit hy lar. This one? Ah, it was it's a binturong, binturong, right? Binturong. Yes. That's hey. Oh, wow. I'm so impressed. Yeah, I have binturong. a, I have a binturong skull at the museum soaking in oh. alcohol right now. <laughs> Nice. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> they also smell like butter popcorn. So, yeah. 
the trivia. Uh, okay, you should know. Everyone should know this. So it's a lion. Tiger. Right? Titi. <laughs> Not a lion. <laughs> it's a small house cat. Um, what about this one? Black bear. Looks, like looks like a big dog. Too. It's not a black bear, it's a sun bear. Uh, Helactus malayanus. <clears throat> I find the word malayanus a bit. Um, okay, what about this one? <laughs> Is it a civet? It's not cougar. a civet. It's not a cougar. Golden cat? Yes, it's a golden cat. Great. Uh, Catapuma mm-hmm. Tamiya. So that was the last one. Thank you very much, you guys, for listening. Do you have any questions? Is the proboscis monkey in the peninsula or in the island? In the island, Borneo Island. We call it the uh, Dutch monkey. Like if we... Why? I think because of the nose. The females <laughs> or the males? Both. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I don't think the Dutch people's nose are like that, but that's how we call it. But anyway. I mean, compared to Malaysians. <laughs> yeah, compared yeah, to our noses. Cute nose. <laughs> Any questions or... Yeah, so like when you, you talked about the, the split between the north and south populations of the elephants and about how there's there's probably a, a decrease in gene flow between the two populations. Um, are there going to be follow-up studies on that, like to actually look at the genetics? Um, good question. So there could be a follow-up study, but um, actually one of the ways to uh, estimate the population size of elephants is using DNA. So you would use the uh, fresh dung and then you get DNA from the fresh dung. So, you know, DNA gives us that information. So that is kind of like a byproduct of that, right? Um, but I think the... So people are already is, doing genetic marker capture for elephants? Um, only in the Taman, Nagar, uh, Taman Gare, the one in the middle. So not in our landscape yet because it's very expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really want to do it, really want to do it. Um, yeah, uh, but that can be done. Um, but the separation has not been that long. I feel like it's probably since 1980, 1970 or 1990. So it's probably not going to be impactful now. But in the future, we don't know. Yeah, I guess. I mean, like, I feel like that's still... <clears throat> If there's like a complete cutoff in gene flow, you can compare with like museum samples collected in like the middle area. Yeah. It seems like there's lots of opportunities to like collaborate with academic labs in Malaysia. A hundred percent. Is that is that like a avenue that WCS is like pursuing? Um, for some reason, we don't we don't normally do uh, collaboration with universities, but I think that should be changed. Um, and hopefully we'll see more uh, collaborations. I mean, one of the, the HEC, the uh, questionnaire survey that we did with the university, that's like one of the um, initial collaborations. So there might be more in the future if you have funding. Funding is key. Everything goes to funding. So, yeah. I feel like you're, li- you're more likely to get funding if you if, if, if they are able to say that they're collaborating with the NGO and if you're saying that you're able to collaborate with a university. With university, yeah. yeah. It's exactly. a win-win. And I think like, I mean, like, would you consider going back for a PhD? <laughs> if Actually, you wanted someone, to do someone, um, I was offered a PhD position twice. One on elephant, one on tiger. And I rejected both because I can't be a student anymore. <laughs> <laughs> This stipend is so low. <laughs> where, where in Malaysia? It's in Malaysia. Maybe oh. that's why. If it's overseas, maybe I will change my mind. But, yeah. yeah, that's how you should do it. You should, you should get an overseas position, but then still be yeah. based in Malaysia. So then you get that foreign, yeah. foreign currency. A lot of people, exchange. a lot of people get that. <laughs> they get like thousand USD, but they're based in Malaysia. I'm like, you're a king. <laughs> you're a king. 
That's how I felt when I went to China with the meme stipend. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, mm. <laughs> anyone else or? Can I ask you a question, Talis? Is this boring to you? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, like, who's who's talking? It's, it's rough. Yes. Hi, Rafael. Hello. Uh, it's not working, is it? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see you. Um, so, uh, so I, I have the feeling that it's a dumb question, but do you did you have firsthand experience of some sort of corruption in the area? And would you say in general that it's something? It's some. It's, so, to what extent do you think there might be corruption that's just like slowing down everything that you guys are trying to do? Um, is this is this thing recorded? Uh, because no. <laughs> Yes, there are absolutely corruption, uh, and it is slowing down um, our work. And it's not just a, at the level of the government um, sector. I mean, there's uh, also the monarchy. So, so okay. So forest areas um, and also natural resources is one of the way for the states to get money. So if they don't have money, the quickest way to get money is to by logging or mining, um, and usually they mine uh, for you know the mine is in forest areas. So sometimes the 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 royal family, if they want money, they would ask uh, the forestry department to log. So. Um, if I will show you the our map, okay. So, so this is the one in the middle is our um, landscape. So this part is fragmented forest. So it used to be permanent reserve forest area, but it is now completely gone. Um, so the the forest status was excised. Um, so it became uh, just state forest, and then now it's uh, becoming oil palm, um, and also mining. And we believe that it's, uh, I mean, it's a state government's decision to do it, but it's probably also prop, um, caused by the monarchy. And saying this is very dangerous. I can be caught. <laughs> so please do not share this with people. <laughs> Okay, maybe I, yeah, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have asked this. No, so, no, it's fine. Yeah, so it, now it that is... you've said all this, maybe, no, no, it's no problem because you've said it anyway. So uh, <laughs> it makes me think that, therefore, if if there is some sort of lobbying or or, or, or corruption that's just interfering with your work, it, it's more on the side of habitat destruction rather than poaching, right? Um, habitat destruction, uh, destruction is huge, but I would say poaching is another huge thing that um, that can be tackled. But the government is doing that, like the the operasi Bespalu Hazana is to tackle poaching, so that can be done. But uh, saving forest areas is still quite difficult. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. So they're 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 still more okay uh, helping you uh, reducing poaching than reducing deforestation. Exactly. Yeah. And if you ask questions about it, they just like don't answer. They give you non-answer answer, which is great. It must be so frustrating. It, yeah, that's why I working in conservation. It's you know you're at a losing end, but you just need to kind of slow it down. So us being there, I feel like uh, it probably slows down um, the the process of. You know deforestation because they're like oh there's an NGO here, and the Sultan knows we're there too. Um, uh, so yeah, a Maybe lot of it's about are... like reputation also because like WCS is like an international organization, so Malaysia yeah, but... doesn't want to like lose face. Yeah, but people don't know <laughs> we exist. <laughs> no one knows, and um, and we don't really say anything. Uh, if you know, for example, the acquisition of the Forest from uh, from its forest status into oil palm, we did not say anything because at the same time, you know, we would like to keep our jobs, so we try to be on the good side um, of the government. 
So even if they do anything bad, we tend to like keep quiet. So that's also another um, frustrating part of working with conservation. Yeah, that's the case in China too. Like you have to work within the boundaries of the government if you want to do any work at all. Exactly. And like in terms of corruption, Raf, like in China, I remember um, like one of the forensic texts telling me that like uh, there's it, there's corruption at the government level for um, wildlife trafficking where they will go and like seize um, like uh, tusks and um, like pieces of art and Chinese medicine and stuff. But then instead of like uh, reporting to the full extent what they got and like destroying it, they will like take some of that for themselves and just keep it in their homes. Cause like these people also like believe in the value of the art and the medicine, right? Like just because they work for the forestry department doesn't mean that they're not like still Chinese with like thousands of years of history. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That also happens here as well. Um, one of it, one of the examples, um, so the forestry, so they're, they're responsible for any log, uh, any timber that comes out from the forest area. So if they see a truck full of timber, any forestry staff can go uh, to the driver and ask for money. Like they can just like, oh, uh, oh, there's a, um, can we go and chase that uh, truck? And then they would go, and then the forestry person would talk to the, the driver or whatever, and then he would come back with cash. So the drivers also know that this is a common thing, so they would also they always bring extra cash around. And it's like not a not a small amount; it's huge, uh, the amount of money that they can ask. So yeah, that's one of the things that uh, you know we've heard um, while working. I have a question about um, like the the border between Malaysia and Thailand. Mm -hmm. Like how like how does that play into conservation in Malaysia? Like is it is it because like that that is the way to China, right? So like that's where the stuff is flowing. Um, yeah. Are there like uh, I don't know border checkpoints set up and. Uh, definitely, and uh, we also, um, Thailand and Malaysia has like forests at, in both both sides. Um, so those forest areas at the border is heavily guarded by the army. Um, so it's, it you, so the tiger population there used to be the highest in the country, but not anymore. <laughs> So I don't, but I don't know why. Um, and the number of elephants being poached in that area is way higher um, than, as uh, you know, compared to our landscape. So I'm not sure if it's something you know because it's bordering Thailand. That's why you know there's a higher um, uh, rate of poaching. I am not sure, uh, but that can be a factor. But at the same time, the area is heavily guarded by military. There's, On uh, both you know, sides? I would say both sides, yeah. Like, how's the relationship between Thailand and Malaysia? Is it like really friendly or is it like, like we're, we're, we're guarding our borders? Like, is the border very clearly demarked? Yeah, yeah it's demarked. Okay. We're not like, oh, like we're- We share know, this forest and there's like- <laughs> Yeah, okay. no, it's, it's clearly marked. We're okay. not like- Because you know, like, like one, one issue, uh, that I hadn't considered until I did my field work in southern China is the like in in Myanmar, for example, in the border between Myanmar and China, there's like uh, there's like a de facto independent state that has their own military and their own government, and they like use Chinese money and everyone speaks Chinese, um, and like they they control their own natural resources and they do all sorts of like illegal stuff because they can <laughs> and like neither china nor myanmar can do anything about it yeah. um and like the yeah, border is very porous <laughs> so i don't know yeah. like if that happens in malaysia too 
it's it's completely like demarked and yeah. Are there are it's, there like it, it might be porous. It might be porous. Okay. But it's demarked. <laughs> are there because like um are there like political factions or rebel groups in Malaysia? Because I, I know in like southern Philippines, right? That's another place where yeah. there's like extremists yeah. who like control yeah. swaths of territory. Yep. Um not in Malaysia. Uh, but other countries, yes. I think even south south of Thailand at one point had like a rebel, um, rebel rebellious factions. Uh, but no, Malaysia is so far so good. Yeah. I think actually wildlife trafficking and also drug trafficking serve mm -hmm. as like ludicrous. Like trafficking. they they make a lot of money off of doing that, and like that's yeah. often how they support their like their armies. Yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of I think there's a lot of human trafficking going on. Um, there are I think articles on like oh, um, graves at the borders, um, Malay uh, Malaysia and Thailand border. There are graves of like these people who could not make it. Um, yeah, but wait, people who could not make it like as in like trafficking from Malaysia to Thailand. Um, usually from Thailand into Malaysia. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like the Rohingya people. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But we're fine down south. We're fine. <laughs> Is either of these two countries like much, much uh, more powerful than the other? I don't, I don't really know. Is that one or, or are they more or less uh, similar in influence? Uh, Malaysia and Thailand. Yeah. Um, I would say we're quite similar. Uh, yeah, money wise, they are better than us. Uh, but I think in general, we're, I don't know, I think we're fine. I think there are Malay other Malaysians in the chat room. Do you want to add? I'm just <laughs> Um, I don't think we're the uh, uh, hostile towards mm. each other. Um, but I cannot really comment on who's stronger. <laughs> yeah, I would I would agree with Kalis that we're sort of equal. We're not really aggressive or hostile towards each other. We, we're quite friendly, actually. Yeah. At we, least we from Malaysia. Know, we all know the strongest one is Singapore. Yeah, I was gonna. That's the th <laughs> that's the next one I was gonna mention. Like, what's the, what's the relationship there? <laughs> We're also fine, but they're very strong. <laughs> <laughs> but they're so small. <laughs> well, economically, they're stronger, yeah. You can just send in I, your military. <laughs> I mean, I feel like in Southeast Asia, we're not like fighting for... I don't think so. I don't think we're fighting for territories or... I mean, in, yeah. in Myanmar, they are. <laughs> yeah, but to China. No, to, to itself. Like to itself. <laughs> to itself? To Thailand? No, no, to itself. Myanmar okay, has like oh, a bunch okay. of these like de facto independent states that are like ethnically and religiously different from the ruling like Buddhist well, juntas. Well, in that case, then Philippines, yeah, they want Sabah back. <laughs> and the rest of the people are like, where are all these countries? Um, <laughs> well, well, I would say it, for in, in Southeast Asia, we're mostly really friendly towards each other, and if, and if there's a mess. Usually it's within their own countries. So yeah. we don't really mess with each other that much. <laughs> yeah. How is um, like China's influence in Malaysia? I know there's a lot of like Chinese, ethnic Chinese Malaysians and like ties are pretty close, I think. Uh, I think quite high, right? China Malaysia tries to be like neutral uh, between China and the US. Um, yeah. Nah, I think economy, economy wise uh, and, and like general politics, we're, we're friendly towards both. But uh, there's an area in the South China Sea that's heavily contested. Uh, and yeah. in that particular situation, uh, the US is siding with us. <laughs> on that one because China wants it but it belongs to yeah, us yeah China like, like <laughs> yeah yeah they just kind of grab around the whole thing. Thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I guess I'm, I'm talking about like more specifically about conservation like are there inter like 
because like obviously like china is a huge like it's the main driving economic force in southeast asia and specifically for uh like wildlife products it's like all going towards china like a little bit to like maybe like taiwan and but like mostly to china um yeah like w is there like w collaborations because like there's wcs china who i am in contact with and they have like offices of, all over the place and they do stuff in china we wcs malaysia works closely with the region um and that includes also wcs china um in uh, especially on wildlife crime um because again that's where all the product edit will end up um so yeah uh we do uh work closely with uh within the region and also uh with china i think our area is called like the the trafficking triangle or something yeah because the malaysian airports are so porous like all of these uh, wildlife products can just go into Malaysian airport to like Vietnam, whatever. Um, so our airport is one of like, unfortunately, the best way for trafficking. <laughs> there's no like, um, I, I'm sure there's like some wildlife forensics that is done like in Malaysia, right? There's like wildlife um, forensic centers. There is one um, uh, with the uh, national, uh, sorry, uh, Wild Park Department, um, but again, with corruption, you know, you can bribe customs to allow right. certain rights to like go. So yeah, I think that's why it's quite porous. Malaysia is considered one of the best kind of gateway to uh, for trafficking. So I'm working with um, a postdoc at WCS in the Bronx Zoo at the like molecular lab in New York. And uh, they are working on a uh, multi-species, like multiplex qPCR assay, to identify like the top eight different endangered uh, big cats, and it's getting pretty close. And um, I think their plan is to like once it's up and running to uh, work with the Nanjing Forestry Police University to deploy the test and. Uh, have like online workshops and train the forestry people there as a pilot and if it works well they want to expand that to the rest of Asia so that might be coming to WCS Malaysia too like yeah. in like maybe a year or two. <laughs> um, I know Indonesia has kind of started that one um, so they have their own genetics um, branch uh, or like a group within WCS um, yeah I'm hoping for Malaysia to have the same as well well, you know who to talk to now. I will collaborate with you, Charles. Yes, we should happens. publish. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to ask. Like, you do so much. Like, you don't because you don't consider yourself a scientist, but like, you collect all this data. Like, are you publishing it? Like, <laughs> um, um, the the tiger data we don't publish, but uh, elephant we do. Um, and I, yeah, we are in the process of writing a paper. But it will not be super scientific. Yeah. yeah. But there are like more conservation focused journals that I think traffic has one, right? Yeah. Definitely. But yeah, no, in the future, let's uh, let's collaborate. Just send me elephant poop. <laughs> we can't, we cannot export natural resources out. All right, I will come to Malaysia and, and uh, like you. create meta barcoding workshops to teach the local Malayan students to do this. <laughs> yeah, um, Just sure. uh, pay for my flight and uh, room and logic. <laughs> we'll, we'll probably pay you way more than that, but yeah. <laughs> uh, that's good too. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Or... I have a question. Yeah. What's the thing you like most about your job? Um, I like that I can do field work and um, in, engage with people, go to places I would not imagine even going. And it's not even like going to the forest area because um, those areas usually the public can't even go. But this is, these are areas that, you know, even if I live in Malaysia, I probably would not ever go because I'm like, what, why would I go to these places? But with WCS, 
the work we do, we go to these areas and and it's amazing. Uh, and it's knowing that you are making changes, even if it's small. Yeah, that's a good feeling. Yeah, I feel like it's it's very different from academia where like you don't feel like you're making a difference at all. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, but it's still useful. If yeah, yeah, yeah. It. But you just don't yeah. see it. You don't see like the the immediate impact. Yeah, applied applied science is the best, I would say. <laughs> but there are a lot of experience where I'm like, is this? a dream like I feel uh, one time um, I can show you this picture the forest was uh, flooded because it was monsoon season so I took this picture uh, this area was uh, supposed to be dry uh, but it was flooded and um, we had to cross many rivers uh, some of them I just decided uh, so when we cross the river the the field assistants would like uh, hack uh, or like cut down trees so that we can use it as a bridge uh, but sometimes it's so treacherous I just like I'm just gonna like swim I just you know like go in just jump with the heavy backpack and just like swim across um, and we did not even manage to go out that day uh, we had to camp another night and the next day uh, we had to cross the final river so that river had uh, actually had logs on it so that you can cross but you could not even see the log you could not see the bridge because the water is above it you can see like a shape of it um, so then you can you just have to like cross but if we slip into the river at the time death there's no way you will survive because I we came back to the same place uh, when it was not uh, flooded and the difference between like you know the flood and like the dry season is like like the water was four meter high at the time and it was the current was so fast so i was like oh my god good thing i did not know how it looked like before or i would have been like super nervous crossing it um but yeah um one of the person in our group actually he slipped but he managed to sit on the log and we were all like screaming like stand up stand up <laughs> you know like it's so nerve-wracking and um yeah and after that that experience kind of like it really fucked me up because the next time i went into the forest i was so nervous my body was just nervous because of that experience um and i couldn't eat and i puked but um but yeah, but it's a it's a memory, a experience I would never forget. Yeah. Life and death. <laughs> Have you had any like uh, really dangerous situations besides that, like with like poachers and? Uh, there were many people that we've uh, met in the forest area, but I try not to engage with them. I just <laughs> whenever I see these people, I just like walk, and then they're like. Where are you going? And I was like, home. You know, like, <laughs> so those are not... definitely poachers. We don't know if there's just uh, if they are poachers or just you know picnic, not picnicking or camping. We don't know. Like people, um, they just want to offer you some food, and they're just trying to be nice. <laughs> I know, <laughs> no, but um, sometimes. Uh, so before, uh, uh. Some of our colleagues uh, shared experience uh, where they met Indo-Chinese poachers in the forest and the Indo-Chinese poachers would like offer them tea and like, hey, like, let's come and like have a chat because they did not know what they, they were doing is wrong. So um, after that, there were more like enforcement activities going on. So then they know uh, that is wrong. So now it becomes more dangerous. But I think most of the time they avoid us when we go into the forest, and they're they're even better than us um, in terms of Field you know live survival, survival skills. Yeah. Do you they, find like there are camps around? We do. Yeah. So 
So those are the things that we also like. Uh, uh, we mark, we document. So we, if we find camps, then we'll be like, okay, is this a local um, people uh, camp or is this uh, Indo Chinese camp? By Indo Chinese, you mean like just like ethnic Chinese people from the Indo Malay Peninsula, or no, from or... like Vietnam, Laos, um, Myanmar. Okay. okay. Um, those Indo Chinese Indo Chinese areas. Okay. Not not Thailand. Uh, yeah, I don't think Thai people coach, but I could be wrong. I'm sure um, some do, but like, yeah, yeah. they don't have a um, reputation. But, but most of them are um, Cambodians and uh, Vietnamese. Um, yeah, so we do have to like document, okay, this is a camp. Uh, how many people can fit in this camp, um, etc. Are there like Chinese people down there too? Like citizens? Okay. Okay. I mean, poaching or poaching, yeah, yeah. All citizens poach. <laughs> I mean, it's just like kind of far. Because <laughs> sometimes oh, I mean, like I, I often hear like it's it's citizens. cheaper. Un- it's cheaper to just like hire local people, right? Because then you don't get in trouble yeah. either. Yeah, uh, not Chinese citizens. But uh, fun fact: uh, Singaporeans also come into our landscape and poach. Really? So, yeah. Do they get like if you catch them and then you, sh- you like send them back, they like really get fucked, don't they? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like I mean, like if you get if you get lashed for like for like spinning bubble come out, like what do you get for for uh, trying to like poach another country's <laughs> natural resources? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> like the death penalty. Because we we hear from other you know from this is intelligent. We're like oh, so the Singaporeans would come and like do whatever in the forest. Like, oh. All right. Does anyone have any other questions before we head out? No, this is super cool, colleagues. It's good to hear about uh, conservation in Southeast Asia because it's very needed there, and often we don't hear much about it from like people there. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, colleagues. It was great. Um, and let me know if you want to collaborate in the future. I would love I to will. come to Malaysia. Your, you will be the first number I call. Nice. Anything what? genetic, let me know. Anything. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. See ya. Ciao, guys. Thank you. Welcome.